thank you for that wonderful introduction. Hi everyone, I wanna to start today by asking you all a question. How many of you have ever belonged to an online forum community? Okay, something that might have looked like this, right? PHP bulletin boards in the good old days of the internet. I spent a good chunk of my middle and high school years on various forms like this, related to topics like video games, music, and graphics. And one of the niche aspects of it that I got really into, that I really enjoyed, was designing forum signatures, or SIGs as they were commonly known by many. These were tiny rectangular images that you would attach to the bottom of all your forum posts. Oftentimes they would feature characters from video games or maybe an anime, maybe a sports team, or quotes from a favorite song or album at the time, or sometimes they were just abstract and artistic. But the point of all of them was to kind of define yourself, your identity, your personality, what's made you different as a part of that community. And I loved it. I loved designing these signatures. And it's part of the reason I got into web development, because I found the creative expression to be relatively similar. So these days, when I think about topics that really excite me in JavaScript, I've been inspired by the number of talks I've heard recently on the intersection of JavaScript and art that are really crying for us to have fun with code and bring creative expression to the web in a new and powerful way. But I personally also get a lot of enjoyment out of talks that focus on practical applications as well as creative ones. And so today, as I thought about this, and as I was thinking of proposals for this conference, I was struck by this thought. Most of the time when we talk about art on the web, it kind of stands alone. It's a code pen demo or maybe some just demo page that you have set up and that's basically it. But what if we brought art into existing user experiences? What if we started using generative art techniques and things like that to craft more unique user experiences for people that visit our applications, our blogs, or whatever website you work on? What if we could create web components that would allow us to easily generate art just by dropping in a single HTML tag? And what if we took advantage of emerging web technologies like web workers and off-screen canvas to not actually impact the user experience while still providing this new different element? So I think pursuing these ideas would be really cool and it's something that I decided to pursue and the result of it is this talk. And so we're actually going to look at how we could implement this today and make it a reality. And there will be some demos throughout. And so the title of this talk is How We Can Generate Art Everywhere Using Web Components and Fast by Using Web Workers. And so those of you might be wondering, who am I? My name is Trent Willis, and I'm a senior UI engineer at Netflix. And more importantly, I'm just someone that really loves the web. And I love talking about web development, JavaScript, everything related to it. But I'm also someone that really loves art and artistic expression. I even minored in art history in college, which is not something that you'll hear from many people. And so today I'm really excited to give this talk because it sits at this intersection of two things that I'm really passionate about and really enjoy discussing. So let's dive into it. To start, when we think about JavaScript and art, what type of art do people usually create? What is the type of art that we wanna talk about today? Well, it's a type of art known as generative art. And generative art is simply art that is created by a non-human system. It's not created directly by humans or artists. Basically, you have a system where you give it some inputs and out the other side you get some generated art without you having to make all the decisions about what that art is going to look like, where things are positioned, what colors are used, and so forth. Oftentimes, generative art is created with computers and a lot of people associate it with computer art because computers are really good at doing stuff without humans having to drive every single action. But that's not the only type of generative art that exists. There are methods which you can generate art by that don't involve the use of computers or actually any machines at all. Some examples of those, oh yeah, so I like to say that generative art is loosely equal to computer art, but it's not strictly equal. So generative art can also be, take the form of algorithmic art, biological art, chemical art, and even robotic art. And some of these have overlap and some of them aren't necessarily generative art all the time. And so classification gets a little fuzzy. But for the purposes of this talk, what we're really focusing on is algorithmic computer art. Images that oftentimes look kind of like these. Some of the commonalities that you'll see between these images is that there are often recurring patterns, some movement throughout it, and 
some randomness, but also some order, right? Like these don't necessarily look like it was just a bunch of random pixels thrown onto your screen. And that's because they all follow an algorithm. And a lot of those algorithms have some element of randomness to it, which makes it generative and kind of unknowable, which makes it interesting. So this stands in contrast to a lot of other types of computer art, which where artists prearrange scenes, specifically place objects everywhere, and then texture them according to some predetermined vision that they have in their mind. So algorithmic computer art, I think, is the type of art that JavaScript is really well suited for, and honestly, a lot of programming languages are as well. Now, within the world of JavaScript, though, we have a couple different ways to approach creating things like this. The first is what I like to call the manual approach. We can use canvas elements, HTML canvases, and various web APIs and manipulate images directly. Or you use native or vanilla web APIs. And you're operating on what is essentially the lowest level of primitive that the browser gives us to create things. And this is really fun and powerful and gives you a lot of flexibility, but it also usually requires you to write quite a bit of code. This stands in contrast to the library-based approach, where instead you use libraries built on top of those APIs, things like P5.js, D3.js, or more specialized libraries like Chromata. The benefit of these, as with most libraries, is you write less code, but you get a little less flexibility. And so I found that you often wind up using aspects of both of these approaches. Most art pieces that I've looked at on the web use both. And so that's what we're going to do today. And so, with that quick whirlwind background out of the way, let's look at our first demo. Cool. Oh, this is gonna be hard, because it's not mirrored. Cool, so here we're generating a simple image that's based on a random number generator, as well as a seeded value, and then a library to help us generate some nice looking colors. And it's a pretty simple demo, but this is the type of thing that you can implement relatively easily. And so I think it serves as a good starting point for our discussion. And so you can find this demo online at Glitch. I love Glitch, I think it's a great way to share ideas, quickly prototype things, and then share them with the community to get feedback on. And so you can find it at glitch.com slash tilde nejs dash demo dash one. So we're gonna quickly look at how this is made, what the high level structure of the code is. And I apologize if you're not in the mood for looking at lots of code right now, but this talk will have a lot more code than some of the previous ones. So we're going to start with an HTML document, and we insert a canvas element into it. And we get an ID so we can easily look it up later so we can use it. And then we insert a single script tag that has our generative R program. Inside that script, we look up our canvas object, and then we call two methods with it, setup and render. And the setup method simply prepares our canvas to then render an image after it, and then render actually renders our image. Within the setup method, we're going to take the canvas, and all we really do is set its width and height. And we have to do this either through setting HTML attributes or through setting it on the JavaScript object directly, and not through CSS, because if we use CSS, we'll actually wind up with a distorted image. And that's because these attributes control the grid or coordinate system used to render images. And so if you adjust the object using CSS, you wind up with a distorted grid. And that's not great. So that's it for setup. Inside our render method, we're going to take our canvas again and start by getting a context from it. A drawing context is what allows you to actually modify the visual appearance of a canvas. And there are a bunch of different types of them, but the two most common forms that you'll see are 2D, two-dimensional two canvases, and then WebGL. WebGL is a lot more complicated, but also lets you do a lot more advanced stuff like 3D graphics. Um, so today we're gonna focus on 2D, though honestly we're not gonna use that many of the context methods. Next, we generate a, we choose a seed value for our random number generator, and then initialize it. And we wanna use a pseudo random number generator because we don't want our image to be truly random, we want it to be reproducible. So that way maybe if you were to integrate this into a site, and you could assign each user uh, an image based off of what their user ID is. You could deliver them a unique default profile picture, for instance. Then using the drawing canvas and our random number generator, we have a draw next point function, or essentially a render function. Uh, and this will use the random number generator to randomly generate elements to put onto the canvas. You can change things such as 
the position of elements, their size, their color, and so forth. Finally, we invoke that method, and then we can loop through it if necessary by using request animation frame. And so this is a very high level overview of how a lot of generative art programs are implemented. And it's up to you to fill in the details of what draw next point actually does. But once you have this code structure in place and you think like, okay, I'm ready to start implementing my drawing function, you have to ask yourself, what do I actually want this to look like? What kind of qualities do I want it to have? How do I make it look nice? And the answer is to actually go back and look at more classic artistic principles. There are a lot of artistic principles that we should consider and apply them to our algorithm design. And these are commonly balance, contrast, emphasis, movement, proportion, repetition, and variety. These seven things are commonly known as artistic principles or artistic elements. And we're going to quickly look at a couple of these and how you might think about them when you're developing an algorithm to generate some art piece. So the first one, movement, is no, sometimes known as rhythm, is simply using recurring elements to draw your eye on some path through an image. So in the demo I showed just a moment ago, a lot of the in images for different seed values move towards the upper left-hand corner of the canvas. And that's because our random number generator is actually more weighted to move things in that direction when we're determining the position of each circle. Repetition is pretty straightforward. It's just repeating an element within an image. And this lets you provide a lot of decoration and a consistent pattern while still making it easy for things to stand out from it, right? And so you can add this to make a piece interesting and then build more interesting tidbits on top of it. And repetition is a very common theme in generative art algorithms because in computers it's really simple, right? You just make a loop and then you repeat something. And then the final one I want to hit on is variety in what its counterpoint is commonly known as is unity. Unity is the idea that all the elements within an image kind of fit together. They work together to make a cohesive whole. Well, variety is ensuring that those different elements can still stand out from each other, still bring something different to the table. We're not just getting one monochromatic, boring blob on our screen. So in the demo, I used a color palette generator that generated all the colors according to a single color theory theme. And that ensures that we have some unity in the image. But we also use a bunch of different colors from that palette to make sure things are interesting and colorful and vibrant and fun. And so that's a quick, very quick whirlwind of some of these artistic principles and how you might think about them as you apply it to algorithm design. But there's one more principle that I think a lot of people should keep in mind, not just as we're developing art, but also just general user experiences, and that is response, right? We're not dealing with a static medium. Computers are interactive. People use their keyboards, their mouses, sometimes even their microphones or their webcams. And so we should be building pieces that respond to that. Right? I'm tired of seeing UI mocks that are just static images, right? That doesn't represent how they're actually interacted with. And so that brings us to the next demo. Um, we're going to take that demo from just a moment ago and turn it into something that responds to sound. And we're going to generate a responsive art piece. And so this next section is going to require some crowd participation. So I hope you all are awake and this will wake you up for the break. So here we go. Okay, once I hit the generate art button, it's going to sample noise through my laptop's microphone for a total of five seconds. During that time, I want you all to cheer, sing a song, stomp your feet, do whatever you want, just make a bunch of noise. Uh, maybe say thank you to the wonderful organizers of this conference and have fun with it. Ready? Here we go. Oh, sorry. Okay, go. <laughs> So there you go. We get a different image from what we saw before, and this is purely based off of the sampled value that came from the microphone. So thank you all for humoring me and contributing your voices to that. 
And so this gives the art piece another dimension to it, right? It makes it a little different, right? You don't see this with a painting in a normal uh, art gallery, right? And so you can find this demo online at a similar URL to the last one, just replace the one with a two. And we're going to look quickly at how you might implement something like this on your own. Now, working with the browser's web audio API is kind of hairy and not a whole lot of fun on its own. So I decided to use a library called P5 and its extension P5.sound. P5 is a library that comes from the processing family of programming languages. Processing is an initiative to make coding more accessible to artists, designers, educators, and beginners, people that don't have a strong technical background. So one of the things that it does really well is make complicated web APIs more accessible and easy to use. So in order to use the microphone of a laptop or a device now, all you have to do is construct a p5.audio in instance. On that instance, we can then call the start method that gets a callback function, which gets invoked once the user has granted permission to use the microphone, as we saw just a moment ago. <laughs> Inside that callback, we can then simply call the get level method on the microphone, and that will give us a numerical value that represents the current volume being received. And then we can simply pass that as a parameter into our render function, and voila, we have it all wired up. Now in the demo, it's a bit more complicated than this because we actually sample the get level method hundreds or thousands of times over those five seconds. But this is the general idea. And even doing it in this simple way would still give you a unique experience. Now, I really wanna highlight that this is so much easier than using the Web Audio API. And so even though a lot of the stuff I'm gonna show today uses vanilla JS or like native APIs, definitely leverage libraries where it makes sense to. Don't limit yourself to always doing things the hard way. Though understanding the hard way provides quite a few benefits to it when you need it. So that covers the basics of generative art. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, this type of art, these demos, kind of just stand by themselves, right? But one of the things I loved about form signatures is they existed alongside other content. They were associated with something other than just themselves. But they were simple images, right? In our case, these demos are not just simple images. We have a lot of markup and a lot of JavaScript that goes along with it. In fact, for that last demo, this is all of the CSS and HTML needed in order to render it. And that's quite a bit of code. And so if you wanted to embed this on a different site or even just include multiple of these on one single page, it requires a lot more effort. So wouldn't it be great if instead of all of that, we could simply write one line, one single HTML element, and add some attributes to parameterize it and customize it. I think this would be really great. And this is essentially what the promise of Web Components is. Let's us reuse this presentation and this behavior that we've already defined once across multiple sites and have it look and behave the same everywhere. Web Components allow us to encapsulate a bunch of HTML and CSS and JavaScript into something that is easily defined and easily integrated into existing web pages. And all you have to do is load it up via a simple script tag. And you don't have to write that much extra JavaScript. And it makes it re easy to reuse pieces of art like we just saw. And so maybe we wanna take our demo from earlier, and instead of just having it be its own canvas, embed it into the context of an article. And maybe we have multiple instances of instances of these where they have different sizes, maybe they sample the audio for a different length of time. And we're going to do this pretty quickly by turning it into a web component. So we start by defining a new class, which is generate art, and it extends an HTML element. This is how you define what's known as a custom element for the browser. We then give it a constructor and call it super method so it actually behaves like an HTML element. And then we create a shadow DOM for it. A shadow DOM is essentially a subtree of the document object model that allows you to isolate it from the rest of the CSS and markup on the page. And so what this means is that we can now insert CSS to style our canvas or our button element that we have without it affecting the rest of the page's CSS and without it being affected by the rest of the page's CSS. We can then set the inner HTML of that shadow DOM to the markup that I showed in the last slide, and it'll work just like before. You might have to tweak a few things to make sure the layout is still correct, but this is the basic premise. And this is really powerful because now we've written that markup once, 
But now in order to reuse it, we only have to write a single HTML line each time. So finally, you might recall that in the slide a few moments ago that there were width and height attributes being set. And we can access those values by calling get attribute on the instance or this. And then we can pass those into a set dimensions method, which is essentially the setup method from earlier. And then finally, we wire up that button, that generate art button with an event listener. And then finally, we register it with the custom elements registry and give it a name of generate dash art. And that's pretty much it. Custom elements are honestly not that hard to begin with. The API is relatively small for them. And so it's fun to try out and just experiment with. And so now we can build pages that look like this. And this is simply the demo from a moment ago, except for now it has the same element embedded multiple times. And so due to time, I'm not gonna go through this because it looks pretty similar to before, but you can find this at glitch.com slash NEJS demo three and check it out and see how you can go about building a relatively straightforward web component. Okay, so embedding art into pages sounds cool in theory, but in practice, we could run into some problems. Oftentimes, generative art algorithms are computationally expensive or they run for a long time, and that can cause issues in the main thread. It could lead to laggy or janky UI interactions like we see in this video. And that's not great, right? Any improvement, any embellishment that we're adding to a page needs to make sure that we're not detracting from the user experience. As web developers and people that are trying to express ourselves on the web, I think one of our first, our first principles that we need to follow is primum non nocere, which is Latin for first, do no harm. Right? I've seen so many applications where, you, where the developers or designers or product managers said, hey, this transition would look cool, or hey, this animation would be really delightful, but then it's just slow and janky and it doesn't look great and it takes longer to do simple tasks and users get frustrated. And so jank is definitely harmful. Our users do not enjoy it. <laughs> and so we have to be careful not to introduce that. And so jank in our generative art case is caused simply by our render function blocking the main thread, similar to what we saw earlier in Jeremy's talk where he had that timeline and there were the red bars at the bottom. And so now when an event happens like a click action, the browser has to wait until we're done parsing all of that code and then it can handle it. And that's not a good experience. We can fix this though by using web workers. And this is a topic that has been around for a while, web workers have, but a lot of folks still don't have that much familiarity with them. Web workers give us a different execution context to run our code in. And so now we can have our render code run in a different thread, and then when a click event happens in the main thread, we can handle it right away, and the user will never be impacted by it. Unfortunately, this wasn't really possible to use in conjunction with Canvas elements up until recently with the introduction of the off-screen Canvas API. This API lets us take our regular Canvas and transfer control of it to an off-screen representation of it. That representation, we can then transfer to a different execution context, such as a web worker. And then we can do as much work as needed without worrying about blocking the main thread. And like most things in this talk, simple usage of it isn't that difficult to get started with. We start by taking our canvas element and then calling a method transfer control to off screen. This gives us back a new off screen instance of it. We then instantiate our web worker, which has our logic, our rendering logic from before. And then we post a message to it where we send in our seed value and maybe uh, our off screen canvas instance. And then from there, we can do whatever we want inside the web worker. And then within the web worker, we need to just listen for that message. And when we get it, call our render function. And that's pretty much it. The demos that I've been showing, like when I moved it into a web worker, we barely had to change anything in the render function. And that's really wonderful because it means that there's not that much work. And now we never have to worry about uh, laggy scrolls or slow clicks. And it should work just like it did before. And so there's another demo that looks exactly like the last one but uses this method. And so you can check it out, see all the source code for it at NEJS demo four on Glitch. So I know that setting up web workers and all that stuff is kind of confusing and it's okay if you didn't get it all down right now because I set up a simple package to make this a lot easier. 
called Easy Off-Screen Canvas. And my hope is that it makes it easier for folks to start experimenting with and having fun trying out using Off-Screen Canvas in web workers. Now you use it pretty simple, simply because it skips all the boring setup for you. You just get your Canvas element, you generate a seed value or whatever props that you want to pass in, and then you pass them into the easy off-screen canvas method along with a render function. That function will become a web worker and execute in a different thread and will automatically be passed the off-screen canvas as well as any other additional props that you passed in. And then once you're done with it, you simply call the terminate method and it cleans it up and you don't have to worry about it. Pretty simple. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of a bunch of things. And I hope you found it somewhat insightful. We started by talking about generative art, how to implement a generative art algorithm, packaged it into a web component, then made it fast by using web workers and learning about off-screen canvas. And I hope that even if you don't consider yourself an artistic or a super creative person, or if you're not into creative coding, I still hope you've been inspired by the new things that the web is bringing to us that allow us to create new and different things that we haven't been able to do in the past. I personally find generative coding to be a really exciting way to embrace creative coding and having fun with the stuff that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And putting the get together the talk or the demos for this talk, I was really excited. I felt some of that passion reigniting that I had when I first started getting into web development. And so I want to leave you all with a little gift today, and this will be my call to action for this talk. That is to check out this glitch called Offscreen Canvas Kit. It's a simple framework setup to create a web component that uses the techniques I talked about today. And so I want to encourage you all to remix it, edit it, do whatever you want with it. It can be as simple or as complex as you want, and then share it with myself, the rest of the development community on Twitter, whatever, but just let's all encourage each other to have fun and try something new. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you all. Have fun and happy coding.